Yeah. So uh, my name is Thomas. And uh, so in uh, in CS we like fancy names. So I was uh, I was flight director we call it. <laughs> so it's a fancy name for for the guy who gets to push the uh, the button <laughs> that makes the, the rocket lift off. So um, I'll just tell you a bit about uh, uh, how Nature 2 flew. So I'll show you a bit of graphs about how it flew. But first I will tell you a bit about uh, just a couple of details about uh, Nature 2 and uh, a little bit about how it, uh, it differs from Nature 1. So Nexi 2 is uh, 6.7 meters long, diameter of uh, 300 millimeters, so it has actually quite a, a bad uh, length to, uh, to diameter ratio. Um, it, it, I mean, it's very long to, to its width. Uh, uh, dry mass, about 180 kilos, and uh, liftoff mass, about 300 kilos, so that's about 115 kilos of propellant on board. So it actually has a, a terrible propellant mass ratio of uh, about 32% uh, or, or something like that. So but for a, a small bipropellant uh, rocket, that's, that's sort of expected. So, you know, valves, they, uh, they don't come in, in super small sizes. Uh, and uh, in general, I think we have sort of, uh, it's a very strong rocket, this one. It's, it's, it's very solid. <laughs> so if you remember, uh, the next one hit the water at 500 kilometers an hour, and it, it, it bent a little bit. Uh, it's a very strong rocket. Uh, it's a very heavy rocket. Um, so it's uh, it has a theoretical aperture of about 14 kilometers with the uh, amount of propellant that it can uh, hold. It's uh, propelled by our own BPM-5 engine, 5 kilonewton, and it runs on liquid oxygen and ethanol. And so uh, now Alex told you a lot about the uh, the video system and the three cameras on board, so that's an upgrade since uh, next year one. And then we have a couple of other upgrades since next year one. So we have the capacitive blocks level sensor sitting in here. So it's essentially a long stick with some electronics up top. So I'll just uh, show you that in the next slide. And then the other big uh, item, big upgrade, is the PVR tank up in the, in the top. So the uh, helium tank. So the uh, capacitive block sensor was an upgrade we made after uh, that. Uh, so we had some troubles fueling next year one when we launched that. So we, uh, we made this uh, LOX level sensor, and so uh, the top of it is uh, seen here, got some electronics here, then we got a lot of uh, fancy, uh, so, so and the LOX level sensor is this one, and then it's uh, the long stick that sticks out here. Uh, so And the stick is basically just a, a, a stainless steel tube with a stainless steel rod inside. So it's a, it's a sort of a linear capacitor, I guess you call it. Uh, so you have uh, the, the liquid oxygen rises in between and changes the, uh, the capacitance of this long stick. So the, the electronics of it is uh, here. Then there's a lot of uh, fancy uh, uh, welding work here by, by mining it. Because this whole unit also serves as, uh, so it serves as a uh, as, uh, gas in. It has a uh, burst disk here. It has a temperature sensor going in. On, on the back side it has a, a, a vent valve. So, so some fancy uh, uh, welding there by, by mining it. And so uh, we use the LOX level sensor when we fill the rocket. It's very important that we fill the uh, right amount of liquid oxygen on board. Mm -hmm. uh, so this graph is, is actually the opposite. This is when the engine is running. So we can also see when, when, we, it, when it empties out. That's not so important. Uh, we, we don't use this data for anything. But the, uh, I didn't have the opposite, opposite data. So, but when we fill it, <laughs> we, uh, we fill it to a, to a very certain uh, amount. And that's the important thing. So, so what, what this one shows during flight doesn't really matter. Um, for filling, it's, it's super important. Then the other upgrade that we made was the DPR system, or the Dynamic Pressure Regulation System. So hardware-wise, it is a uh, tank, 20 liters, 300 bars, and then it has a main on-off valve down here, and then it has the two regulation valves. And so that will feed the uh, two propellant tanks, the fuel tank, the LOX tank, with helium. And in that way, it will keep the, uh, the pressure up in the propellant tank. So you can see, I have some test data over here. So you can see this is from a static <coughs> test. So you can see the, uh, the propellant tanks, the red and the blue, they are totally flat when the engine is running and the, the combustion chamber pressure is the black curve. And you can see on the bottom graph, you can see the, the pressure in, the, uh, in this tank. So as, uh, as we're spending uh, helium, of course, it uh, loses pressure. But so the whole purpose of this is to make sure that we have a constant pressure uh, from the uh, engine, uh, such that we get the highest possible efficiency when we uh, when we burn the propellants, 
and it also means that we can actually fill more propellant in the tanks because we don't need a big gas pocket to drive the whole system because the, the gas pocket is in here and it's 300 bars initially. So, um, you might also know that we were supposed to launch Nexo 2 in 2017. So that didn't happen. So instead, Nexo 2 became our most well-tested uh, <laughs> rocket. So we did a lot of testing. And I'm not going to bore you with the details of it, but we, uh, we did a lot of testing. So we, of course, did some cold soap and flow with uh, liquid nitrogen to, to test the uh, cryogenic uh, uh, properties of the rocket. So, so we have the rocket tank down here. Right here is the insulated. <coughs> uh, and we did a lot of uh, these uh, harbor acceptance tests, uh, sea acceptance tests, both in uh, 2017 and again in 2018. And in 2018, it went uh, a lot smoother. We, uh, we really had prepared uh, a lot better in 2018. And uh, we did a lot of testing. And so also when we, when we finally launched it, it was uh, all procedures sort of was uh, on the back of, of uh, I mean, everybody knew what to do. And, and all systems had been really tested. Uh, and, uh, and during the operation, everything basically performed flawlessly. So now the uh, next year, two flight events. Uh, very simple. So uh, just like what we want to do with the, our astronaut one day. So uh, rocket lifts off, uh, and so with the amount of propellant on board, uh, engine cutoff should be after about 45 seconds. It should coast to apogee. Nose cone is uh, deployed with a uh, with a gas generator. It's a small explosion. Um, then the balloon pops out, perish, uh, and then when it descends below 3,000 meters. Uh, then the uh, computer will deploy the parachute, and then it will land. So very simple uh, flight event. True. So um, the expected flight profile. Um, so next thing one is a heavy rocket, as I said. So we have acceleration over here. So acceleration starts at about six meters per second square. So uh, zero point six g's, and then it increases to about one point one g. It's a it's a heavy rocket, uh, slow acceleration rocket. So accelerates like a Falcon 9, more or less. Um, and so that should take about 45 seconds. And then it should reach max speed. So the speed is here. We should reach something like 375 meters per second. So slightly supersonic. And then it should coast up to apogee of uh, about 13 kilometers. And, and then the uh, balloon comes out and, uh, and it drops down. So the balloon would, uh, it would be dragging the balloon here with one uh, speed. And then the parachute comes down. Um, and you'll also see that the, uh, the thrust level, so you'll see we start out with 5 kN and then simply because the rocket rises to a thinner atmosphere, then uh, the thrust increases, provided that the engine has a constant uh, pressure. Then simply because the uh, surrounding pressure drops, <coughs> then the, the thrust increases. Now, so it, it didn't go uh, exactly like this, uh, and <coughs> I'll show you uh, in a few slides. So I, uh, I'm not going to talk so much about the procedures themselves because I'm pretty sure that Jakob will uh, will tell about some of the preparations we did. But so uh, as you know, we were on Bonham uh, 3rd and 4th of uh, August, and so I had the uh, the luxury of mostly sitting behind a computer while everybody was uh, was working, uh, hosting, uh, checking out uh, systems, and um, and so I think Jakob will tell a bit about that. Uh, so in the end, it got uh, got very late. It, you can't see it on here, but, but there's people sleeping on the day of here. So, so we ended up being sort of ready to uh, to pack everything up at around midnight. And because we had to launch quite early in the morning, uh, we had to depart at 2 a.m. So uh, so not much room for sleep uh, on, on this Friday. Um, but we, uh, we of course, went out. And uh, so again, uh, uh, Yara will tell you a bit about some of the procedures we do out at sea. Um, I will jump directly to, uh, well, to, uh, to lift off. Um, so it uh, makes the two flew beautifully, as we are also seeing in, in Klaus's movie. And, um, and in, the, uh, in the end, it uh, did the first ever super nice uh, planned parachute landing in CS. And if you look really, really closely, you can see the uh, nose cone is popping out here. Um, <laughs> So uh, and uh, and we as we also saw in Klaus's movie, we uh, recovered it with the uh, with the crane of our wonderful uh, new mission control ship. Um, so I uh, let's uh, have a look at some data. So I made a small uh, small movie 
or small animation of some of the data. <laughs> and so, so there's some stuff going on in this one. So we got altitude over here. We got vertical speed here. Uh, you will be able to see the uh, angles of the rudders. Maybe we should kill the lights. Um, can we kill the lights? Is that over here? Okay. So, and then over here you can also see some uh, some grammar. So you got pressure in the GPR section. You've got uh, duty cycle on the regulation valves, pressure block tank, pressure fuel tank, pressure combustion <coughs> chamber thrust, and estimated mass of the rock. Um, right, and then so the video is almost ready. So so you will see at some there's some jittery motion, especially on the roll axis. So you will see at some points the rocket rolls very rapidly. That's a small bug that I haven't been able to iron out uh, yet. But I think we'll do that before we release <coughs> it on YouTube. So it's a, it's a preview of a something that's not entirely ready, but almost. We are go for launch. Auto sequence start in five, four, three, two, one. T minus thirty seconds and counting. In five seconds, you'll see the uh, pressure going up. Twenty seconds. Tanks pressurizing. Fuel tank at flight pressure. T minus ten seconds. Lock tank at flight pressure. Five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. meters, 4,000 meters, 5,000 meters, we have main engine cut off, 6,000 meters, right, so zero velocity, that's the apogee, And the balloon comes out. No cone off. <coughs> Apogee. Yeah, and so, so there's some of the material that I'm. Shoot is the pod. I don't know. Okay. But so from this point, then uh, the rocket just descends. Shoot to is carrying the rocket nose up. To 3,000 meters. And then it will uh, deploy the parachute. 5,000 meters. So I, I think that this was sort of the uh, the action uh, sequence of it. So uh, so let's uh, keep the lights again. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. So because I also have this in a graph form. <laughs> so uh, so it's easier to uh, to see what what we're talking about. So um, if we're looking at the uh, at the altitude, so we are peaking at uh, six and a half thousand meters, um, and we were we were wanting thirteen kilometers. And so, so why didn't it go higher? So the uh, the obvious uh, explanation uh, is that the uh, thrust. So we got thrust here. So we never reached 5,000 newton. So the thrust level was at all time low. And um, and so I, I, actually I never saw the launch myself. I was looking at a screen. And so I, I, I noticed from from the incoming data on Scott's terminal that the uh, combustion chamber pressure was low. And so combustion chamber is the, the blue line here. So you can see we were supposed to be at 15 parts. And we start out at uh, close to 14, then it drops to just below 13, and we finish around 14 bars. So we never got the uh, the right pressure in the engine, and um, and so the the result of that is obviously that if you look at the acceleration <coughs> curve, so you got the blue actual acceleration, red is the uh, expected as acceleration. So you can see at all times we're accelerating slightly slower than we should, and you can also see acceleration stops 10 seconds early. Um, and so, so why is this? So again, if you look at the curves up here, combustion chamber pressure is too low. The LOX tank pressure is also too low. So the LOX tank pressure should be somewhere up here. 
And if you, uh, so the way the, the pressure regulation works is that we have a set point that the, the system is, is aiming for. So it's, it's aiming for keeping the, the, the pressure in the tank at some level. So we have the, the error over here. So for instance, the dark red curve here, that is the error on the fuel pressure. So the difference between the actual pressure and the target. So you can see, at the, we start out with a low error, and then it increases to 0.8 bar. So on the fuel side, we almost get the pressure in the fuel tank that we want. But on the LOX tank, that's a dark blue. So the error on the LOX tank. So we start out with two bars too little pressure. Here we have four bars too little pressure, and then it drops down to two bars. So at all times, we have between two and four bar too little pressure in the LOX tank. And so that gives the, uh, the low pressure in the... Uh, in the combustion chamber and the low acceleration, um, and so so why is uh, or, or what does that mean? So when we we have uh, the, the fuel pressure uh, up here is uh, is more or less correct, but the LOX pressure is too low. That means we're running too much fuel into the engine, and that means that we are depleting fuel faster than we uh, than we want. So at the, at some point we run out of fuel. That's the LOX level. Uh, and that is why the engine cuts out 10 seconds early. That's because we have used all the fuel. There's still locks remaining. So how much locks could there be remaining at that stage? So we also have a curve of the estimated mass. And the estimated mass here, so that it's estimated, remember? So it's, uh, it comes from, the, uh, from knowing the forces on the rocket mm -hmm. and knowing the acceleration. So the two forces on the <coughs> rocket is uh, thrust and then it's drag. So drag is, uh, is a result of... Uh, airspeed or I mean, <coughs> the, the velocity and then we have uh, assumed a, a drag coefficient so we know the thrust we think we know the drag coefficient and it's the drag and uh, we know the acceleration so we can deduce the mass so the mass starts out at about 300 kilos which is correct and then it drops down to 215 kilos and the dry mass is 180 so that means at, uh, at burnout we still have around 35 kilos of LOX still in the system so we actually only used something like 75% of, of our propellant um, due to a low pressure on the lock side. And so why is there a low pressure on the lock side? So if we uh, look at the, this part, so the pressurization part of the uh, sequence, so before lift off. So this is uh, T minus 25 seconds, so 25 seconds before lift off. So here we start pressurizing the two tanks. So red is uh, pressure in the fuel tank, blue is pressure in the low tank. So you can see the fuel uh, pressure comes up very fast, three seconds from uh, from here to flight pressure. The LOX tank, it takes more than 10 seconds to pressurize it. And initially, it pressurizes at almost five bars in a second, then it drops to 1.1 bars per second. So right here, something happens right there. Um, so you can see the, uh, the duty cycle of the uh, LOX uh, regulation valve doesn't change. So, but, but something happens with the valve or the piping between the, uh, the DPR tank and the uh, propellant tank. Something happens right here uh, where not enough helium gets from the DPR tank to the LOX tank. And so I'm very curious to, to get the rocket back and actually disassemble this valve to see if there's an error in it, if it's clogged with something or, or what happened. But, uh, but something has, has happened with that valve. And that has reduced the uh, amount of helium going into the uh, to the So, um, yeah. So, um, apart from the uh, not so high as anticipated apogee, then we are extremely uh, pleased with this lab. So, um, so we, we sort of have a small goals list. So we, uh, operating a bipropellant rocket at sea is, is, is not that easy and launching it. So uh, launching it, it in its own is, uh, is, is a feat, we think. So it's the second time we've done this with a, a liquid bi-prop. And, and for the first time, the, uh, the whole recovery, the set-wise, uh, worked flawlessly. And uh, so the electronics and telemetry worked uh, almost flawlessly as well. Uh, so we had one transmitter setting out, or receiver. Uh, but apart from that, we had uh, full control of the rocket at all times. And we received data from the rocket at all times. So, uh, so operational and, and flight-wise, we're very satisfied, uh, and uh, and we consider the next two mission to uh, to be a great success, and uh, <coughs> and then uh, we'll move on from there to something much much bigger and, uh, and more interesting. So I think that was uh, that was it for uh, for me.
Thank you.